So we will look to the notion of uh, clock drift and how we are going to compensate for clock drift in our algorithm for time lease. To start this discussion, we have to understand what does it, what is the unit of time, and how to relate the local clocks, which are physical oscillators in each machine, to a global notion of time. Okay, global notion of time. So we want to understand uh, now and look to introduce clocks more formally. Let's have an introduction to clocks here. So each process PI has an associated clock CI. So this is a local clock for the process PI. The clock is really a function, our model as a function, from real time to clock times. So T denotes the notion of a real time. And CI denotes the notion of if you CI will be a function that tells you about the local clock in real time. <coughs> so what is real time? So real time will take is defined by some time standard. For example, the coordinated universal time. And the unit of real time in UTC, or the universal coordinated universal time, is actually defined, defines what is a standard second. So this is the international standard of second. Huh? And the definition states the following. We are going to show you the definition, but we don't really need to understand it. It says that the second is the duration of 9,182,6,301,770 periods of radiation corresponding to the transition between to hyper fine levels of the ground state of the cesium atom 133. We don't really need to understand this. Okay? It just we need to know that there is a standard related to a physical phenomena which is transitions in a cesium atom. Mm. And it is quite precise. Yeah. Yes. So let's look now to local clock implementations on a machine. So a clock is implemented as an oscillator and a counter register. Okay? So there's an oscillator in each machine and a counter register that is incremented for each tick of the oscillator, or for each period of the oscillator, basically. Hmm? So. so the oscillator frequency is never completely stable. It varies depending on environmental conditions. For example, temperature or pressure. Mm -hmm. And the oscillator manufacturer for each physical clock, each machine specifies a nominal frequency and also an error bound. The most important thing here is that it specifies an error bound. And that's what we are going to use. So the manufacturer guarantees an error bound. So let us Let's have a look. So the clock rate, in fact, specifies how much the clock is incremented each second of real time. For example, the counter increments by, this is a normal, like 1 million ticks per second, but with some bounded error of plus or minus 100 ticks per second. And this is guaranteed by the manufacturer. And that is the thing that we are going to use. So, from here on, we normalize the clock rate so, so that 1 will be the nominal rate and the error is characterized by rho. And rho will be the drift within a unit time. Okay? So 
And so what is this? This is saying the rate of change of the clock related to real time, with respect to real time, rate of change, respect to real time, may vary between at the upper bound 1 plus rho and at the lower bound 1 divided by 1 plus rho. And rho, if we take our example, will be, this is normalized, will be 100, this is 100 ticks, divided by 1 million. So this is 100 part per million. Okay. So this says that the rate of change of the clock with respect to real time can be a little bit faster. So it goes up to 1 million plus 100 when it's fast or can be slower by divided 1 over this. So you can see it clearly. So the clock drift again. The clock drift is the accumulated effect of the clock rate that differs from real time. This is the accumulated effect. So when the clock does not drift, so d the, the differentiation of, or the, the derivative of c with respect to time will be 1. So, so c equal t means the clock does not drift. And so dc over dt will be equal to 1, clearly. OK. And that's what we said here. So ideally, the clock does not drift. And that's what we have here. So if we draw a picture where this is the x-axis is real time, and this is the y-axis is the clock time. So ideally, the clock moves is the same as real time. So, so at a certain time t, here, the clock also is t. But in reality, that is not the case. The clock moves in, in this cone, in this period, right? So, so the accumulated clock time, that this curve shows the accumulated clock time. So, for example, at time t, our physical, our, our physical clock on the process says this is the, the, the number of ticks or the time. So, so now we understand a little bit about what is physical time and what is a clock. So let's try to reason in our algorithm what happens when the clock of the proposal drifts. And we will reason about that to see. So the reason about what happens if a proposal uses clock time instead of real time without any compensation, without any compensation. So what happens here? So here is one case that during the least period, the clock runs faster than real time of the proposal. In fact, in this case, safety cannot be violated because the proposer will believe that its lease expires sooner than it, it actually did. This is really affect the performance a uh, little bit negatively. His duration that he believes that he can, his duration of the lease will be shrunk, basically. The other case is more important and we have to take care of, which is the clock runs slower than real time. In this case, the proposal believes that it holds the lease even after the lease has expired. So he is holding because his clock is slower. So the proposal may respond to a read which he does not really have the lease, and that might violate safety. Very good. Let's look again. So now, the proposer must compensate by assuming the slowest possible 
clock rate. So he assumed this, this was a bound, that his clock is going slowly. He has to assume that, okay? So that he can compensate in case, uh, compensate for the error, let us say. Let us see what this is saying. So this is, delta t is a period of time we would like to have. And we say 10, the time this, has to be greater or equal t. And because we assume now the clock is slow, then delta t should be equal 1 plus rho delta c. You can see it from this, from this equation, that dc times 1 plus rho should be equal to dt, okay? And what that says to us about the time period uh, uh, of the, the time period on the proposals, with the proposals clock. It says that it has to be, delta c has to be less than 10 divided by 1 plus rho. It means now he is going to assume a shorter period of time. By the same reasoning, actually, the acceptor should be compensated assuming the fastest possible clock, which is that, which again would mean that the acceptor will extend little bit the time period that he is giving for the proposer to compensate for the error uh, of that um, f the error in the clock in his own clock oh, okay and by the same reasoning we get here that the period should be greater than or equal 10 times 1 plus rho and and the reasoning uh, we know that the reasoning that safety cannot be violated if the acceptor waits longer than necessary to give a new promise. That is clear. So let us look now to the whole picture. So let us look at the acceptor first. And the acceptor, and then we look at the proposal. So we're going to have a new state variable called TP. And this is the clock time when he gave a promise. Remember, the acceptor gets a prepare and he gives a promise. It's the clock time when he gets a promise. Then, so, say it one more time, if the acceptor, PJ, gets a prepare, and N is greater than what he has promised before, that's what, this is what it says, and his clock minus TP is greater than 10 times 1 plus rho, it means that the time period he gave for an earlier proposal has expired. Then he can give a promise to that new prepare to reject rounds lower than N and not give new promises until within the next 10 seconds, okay? And he, of course, sets TP2. Otherwise, of course, he will respond to a NAC because it means he's still reserved, okay? So let us look to Lizzie's at the proposer. The proposer new state is variable uh, TL that we're going to use here. And before PI sends a prepare message to the acceptors, he sets his TL to his local clock. And if PI gets promise from majority, P knows that no other process now can become a leader until 10 seconds after TL. And as long as this condition holds, what is the condition? That CI, his own clock, minus TL, 
If this is less than 10 divided by 1 plus rho, so this is a shorter period, normally it was 1 less than 10, then he can respond to reads from its local state. Very good. So let us look again to this as a time diagram. And so this is TL. This is the time when the proposer send a prepare. That is fine. And this is TP. This is the time where an acceptor sets his own clock. This is fine. This is where you get a promise, a T2, very good, that is as usual. This is now T3 is an interesting thing, T3 is actually, is, so this is a period, this is T3, what is the period, what is this period? So it is the clock of T3 minus TL, okay, should be 10 divided by 1 plus rho. Okay, so that is, it means that, what do we mean here? It means that this period should be 10 divided by 1 plus rho. Okay, so that is, and this is the period where he can accept reads. Very good. So P1 has least between T2 and T3. Now, when, he, when we look to the acceptor, this is Tp, is, is C2, his clock at time T1. And this is the point T4, he computes T4, which is computed as the clock at time T4 minus Tp should be equal to this. Very good. So that is, so he's, he's really waiting for a, a bit longer time. So that's what he, okay. And then, so P2 may grant another promise after T4. Okay, so this is, but he has completed T4 now by using this equation, as you can see. Okay. So, that is the period he's going to, this is the period he's going to, to wait for. Okay. Very good. So, during this period, he will reject any prepared messages from other proposals. That's what he did here, and that's it. So, so that is really the algorithm now. We have compensated for the asynchronous network communication time, the sending and receiving messages, and we also compensated for the drift. And now, so we look to extending the time. So as long as PI is alive and well, it should remain as a leader. And to not lose the lease, he, from time to time, requests an extension of the lease. And he can do it a few seconds before the lease expires. A few seconds before the lease expires, BI records the current clock time and asks for extension. And if an extension is granted by a majority of replicas, then he can continue holding the lease. Ten more seconds. By this, we finish the lease base the least based mechanism for Paxos groups but and it's also here was to it was le the lease was done to make sure that a node will be a leader a process will be a leader for an extended period of time in fact the same idea of lease and Paxos groups can be used in so many other situations for example it could be used, you can have Paxos groups, if you want to acquire resources. And these resources is a form of a mutual exclusion. You want to have exclusive access to a resource. Then 
a process that needs an exclusive access to a resource. There will be a Paxos group for that resource. It will, exactly as usual, try to acquire a resource by doing a prepare uh, for a period of time. And if it succeeds and gets the promises, then it acquires a resource for that period of time. And it can always, of course, uh, send back a um, cancellation of the resource if it finishes before or it can renew its lease. So you can use it for many different things, not only for electing a leader, but also for mutual exclusion in a distributed data center. Thank you, and that's it.